You know what the Atari motto is? Innovative leisure, right? Well, it didn't say innovative arcade games. It didn't say innovative video games. It said innovative leisure. It was broad from day one. I mean, Nolan always had a consumer game in his mind because that's what he hired me to do. And I wound up doing the wrong thing and making a hit coin-op game, right? When I was at Ampex, I learned how to make sync generators, synchronizing the basic fundamental uh, uh, circuit necessary to get a TV signal, because we had to generate an analog signal. So you do that, and you get the ball at one speed, and you put paddles up, and it's not, it's a very, very boring game. And uh, uh, so I had to, I added the speed up, and I added the angles off of that, just, you know, what to make it so playable, interesting. And, uh, and so I eh, started getting a little interesting. That's cute. And Nolan said, well, it's got to have score. We had a pretty good game. And hey, great. So what are you going to do for sound? He goes, sound? I'm already over budget. What am I going to do? Uh, uh, and Nolan said, well, I want the sound of a roar of a crowd of thousands applauding your win. And Ted said, I want boos and hisses. And I'm thinking, how do I do that? Listen, I got video. I got the goddamn game up. Uh, now you wanted me to do this. I'll be right back. So I was pissed around for a day and poked around sounds that already existed in the vertical sync generator and gated them out with the 555 timer. I love it. Years later, the sound is so well thought out, so appropriate. It was like, are you kidding me? It was just, you know, just thrown together in, in spite of what the boss said. And so uh, that, that was how, that was how uh, Pong came to be. So everybody's heard the Pong story. Probably everybody's heard the Pong story, but I've heard it many times, uh, and from Al Alcorn himself, who designed Pong, so. Uh, the story I've heard is that they installed one of the first Pong machines in a tavern and let people play it um, as a test. Put it out into an arcade and see if it makes money. I mean, that's, that's the market research. My understanding was Ted built a cabinet uh, a, a tabletop, simple, simple cabinet uh, over the weekend, and uh, a coin mech bolted to the side of the cabinet, tabletop type of big thing was sit on a barrel. Placing a interactive video machine somewhere and having people play it was still a relatively new concept. Nobody knew if it was going to go. Oh, what is the name of the bar in Palo Alto? San Jose? No, it was Andy Capps. Uh, it was Santa Clara? Sunnyvale. So we We'll put it in Andy Caps. You know, it's it's a it's a coin op game, be it fragile and humble, uh, and and so so we did. Well, my memory is that he gets a phone call, the game's busted, which of course is the usual thing you get on a support line. It doesn't work. What is it, and in what way does it not work? Well, it doesn't work. The bar owner or manager at the time kind of yelled at them and, and like accused them of their game being shoddy because it had already broken down and it was no longer functioning or working. 
and they get a call, you know, later on that night and like, hey, this fucking thing broke, you know, <laughs> get, come and, come and peek, pick up this piece of shit game and get it out of here. <laughs> you know, this fucking thing broke. You know, I don't, I'm not going to waste my time fixing this crap. But anyway, the machine, we got the word that it stopped working and I figured it could be anything and I'd go out there and take a look at it. And uh, so I went to the, uh, went to the machine uh, and the first thing you do is you want to try to play the game because the machine was on in a tracked mode so there was it was working but you couldn't start a game so you open up the coin the coin box to basically flip the micro switch to give yourself a free game because i'm not going to waste a quarter you know and so they went down to see what's wrong in the machine to fix it and what they found out was that it wasn't broken it was just that so many people had played it they'd filled the coin box with quarters and it was jammed and it couldn't take any more so many people had played it that you could that it couldn't accept any more money. The game is broken because it's stuffed so full of quarters. Completely stuffed with quarters. It, and it was a small, I remember it was kind of small, if I remember it was a small space. It just filled up with the quarters and it, it wouldn't take it. When I opened up the coin mech, you know, it's, all these quarters just gushed out. So, whoa, that's impressive. It's the equivalent of like crashing a server. When you launch a new website and it's so popular. So they crashed the server on Pong. And one of the other reasons it was also so popular is because you could play with one hand while you're still holding a pint in your other hand. Um, and that also was one of those things that, you know, eventually many, many years later led to the rise of the fun barcades that we have, you know, and we can enjoy now. As Al will always say with a, with a little, you know, twinkle in his eye, he goes, this is a problem I can fix. Basically, the way it worked was you take the money, the, the deal you have, and you split the take with the owner of the bar. And so I would, so I did that, and I had this sack of quarters, and the next day I come into work, and I said, oh, I got the machine fixed, and here's the problem. The goddamn thing's making too much money. And no one, really? But it was, it was one of those great moments where something that uh, supposedly was failing was, was actually such a huge success that no one could recognize. It was truly the ugly duckling version of technology. Because remember, no one thought, I'm, he was like, this is just the placeholder until we get to design the really good game, because who's going to play this stupid shit-ass game? They went on to produce all of these classic, memorable arcade titles for years that allowed the company to survive and, and be so much more than a one-hit wonder. So that's my understanding of the history of Pong. It's a great story, if it's true. <laughs> when a story is good, you know there's some doubt about it. Like, well, that's too good to be really true. It's probably a boring version of it that's actually true. Uh, you know, I, 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 it sounds, it sounds realistic to me. You know, I mean, uh, I've, you know, I've kind of seen that happen in my own. And, and when you do get a really great game, the coins will just overflow, and uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a cool feeling. <laughs> anyway, that's how that all happened. Yeah.
I mean, Atari really, what, why were they in the pinball business? You know, here they had this tiger by the tail of video games, you know, just this supernova of uh, creativity and possibilities. And, you know, they were nailing it left and right, creating new genre, genres every other week. Why would you mess around with pinball? You could tell the, um, our games were just not working, you know, and due to reliability, poor engineering, you know, thermal issues. Um, issues of the games just falling apart, poor hardware design. You know, it just, I could see the writing was on the wall that, that we were going to go down. I mean, the pinball basic division was just a massive disaster. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, it was, it's, it's kind of the, um, uh, you know, kind of the hubris of, uh, you know, I guess Silicon Valley, uh, even in that era, you know, was like, oh, these, these morons in Chicago, they make these crappy old games, you know, like, 
you know, we're, we're gonna redesign everything. We're gonna put the display down in the bottom. We're gonna, you know, put the boards, you know, underneath the play field so all the crap falls in and shorts out the things. And I mean, it was really horrific design and uh, they caught on fire. And, um, the solenoids, they, they used this thing called rotary solenoids, which burned up and the screws fell out. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a, you know, just a complete disaster as far as like design and also testing and, so there, there was uh, a lot of games that caught on fire in the early days. So, but I, they, they made a lot of money when they were working. You know, we did, I, I, you know, the programming was awesome because I did it, you know.
you will hear stories of hot tubs in the lobby and drug use in the office. And I'm here to tell you that none of that happened in my department. We started smoking pot right in our office. Rob and I were like the premier pot. Now, sorry, Rob. Um, I and some other person who occasionally shared an office with me for five years at Atari, however that freaking worked, we would just fire up right in the office. It's like, who knows why? It's like, this is like, it's illegal. It's like, it wasn't even a sense of privilege. It was just mindlessness. I worked in a satellite office. I started in 1977, which was still pretty early. It was only 18 months since the 2600 came out. Uh, but there, were, there was no hot tub in the lobby of the office that I went to. There was no drug use in Atari, though I don't doubt that it was over where Howard and Todd Fry were working. Uh, drugs were consumed at Atari by all kinds of people at all levels of management from the bottom to the top and all over engineering. Not everybody did drugs, but uh, some people did and some people enjoyed them and some people abused them, and some people went to the hospital on them. And, uh, but by and large, drugs were a relatively nominal uh, factor. Uh, drugs, you know, there was a lot of marijuana, and it would participated a lot in brainstormings. So we had the way of, you know, trying to incorporate drugs into our productivity model. I went home and I smoked a joint, a little bit of cocaine and a little bit of psilocybin in it. And I was sitting there, it was about half gone when I realized, oh, you could do that. And it's like, I put it out and I went and I wrote a page of notes. And my design for that kernel was exactly what it ended up, ended up shipping. It was like, it has a tremendous amount of effort actually to get everything organized. You know, they, they did have good deliveries of cannabis in the inter-office mail. You know, that was, that was probably the primary use of those, those yellow manila envelopes. Um, so that, I think it was, you know, Fridays or Monday, I think it was Fridays when the, you get these really thick envelopes coming through the system. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, there, and there was weird, there was like, there was a guy working there and his, his job was, he was the weed dealer. <laughs> you know, that was, he didn't really, that was his sole job <laughs> at the whole company. And there was a very straight German VP of hardware down the hallway in the building, I have no idea. Um, and um, he complained to management about the smell of pot smoke in the corridors. So they got him an office in a different building. <laughs> I, I have been asthmatic since I've been 12. I, I need drugs to, to, to breathe. I did not do drugs, because drugs to me were something that let you get up in the morning, you know, and breathe. So I, and, and nor did I think I wanted to mix those things. I, I, the high of me was doing the work. And I was always a happy guy, so I just didn't need, I just didn't feel I needed it. So I never did drugs, but there were a lot there. Don't put too much stock in the fact that every Atari employee was stoned out of their minds while making games. I mean, there was all kinds of drugs consumed at Atari, but the, the real drug at Atari was going into a store and seeing your product, seeing your game on a shelf.
When was this? 1980, 81, that time frame. Prior to Ray Kassar's emergence, I was part of the executive staff, you know, and Nolan, Joe, I, Steve Bristow, Gil, uh, Dennis Groth, fi finance, you know. We were all friends and no politics and all that, and we all worked together and, and uh, part of the team. It, set, it, was, it was great. Once Ray took over, nope, it was all a closed office and he had his, he met with all his hires from Procter and & Gamble and so I realized, okay, I'm out of this. I'm either going to have to quit because Nolan had gone, Joe had gone, uh, Lipkin, everybody had gone. Uh, I figured, well, I'll go back. This is my baby. I'm going to do it one more time. And I, we had used holography. We had, we couldn't keep secrets at Atari. We're just no good at it. So, so uh, we decided the best thing to do was put out disinformation. So the, the, one of the best ones was, well, the next coin-op game's gonna have holography in it. Was like, what the hell's that? I knew what it was, because having you know, been to college and studied this physics and stuff. But that was just, but then anyway, I decided, well, I'll do something, let's do something in holography. Maybe there's something there. I'll take it, sounds, sounds hard, sounds interesting. I know a little bit about it. And uh, we proceeded to explore holography and what could be done and uh, came up with a, with a holographic toy that basically sold it to Ray saying, how would you like, because the cartridge video game business seemed to be very good. How would you like to have a system where the cartridge, it's a cartridge based system, but the cartridges are half the cost of, everything is half the cost of the VCS. And, hey, go ahead. It were very simple. They were nothing more than a, an LED. Uh, a, a simple LED game, the handheld LED game in those days. The only difference was we had a hologram with two images on it. You look through this box and there were two lamps inside and, and when you'd crash a spaceship, you'd see a hologram of a spaceship crashing. And, uh, but you could look through this half-metalized mylar and, and play a, a space invader game or something like that. We did all the work, put everything together, got a chip designed, package designed, and, and at the end, Ray wouldn't. I mean, we even took it to the toy fair uh, or the consumer, we, and, and marketing wouldn't show it, wouldn't back it up, and we did it ourselves, engineering. And we sold, we think we sold 100,000 of them, but Ray wouldn't, would not release it, just wouldn't do it. And I realized that was it. Uh, they're not going to release that. I mean, this is now in a time when if it failed 
You wouldn't even notice it. It wouldn't be a pimple on the balance sheet. But they were afraid to do it. Back when it would, the whole company was, we well, yeah, sure we'd do it. So that was the end of my career at Atari.